Now the last topic, stochastic optimization. In many cases, uh, we don't have deterministic functions that we can just um, evaluate and always get the, get the same output. Well, the problem is that oftentimes we are optimizing um, some real world process, for example, and um, well, we can, we can apply the same settings, but a real world process is often noisy and will not give us back the same result every time. And um, there are now methods for uh, optimizing in a setting where the evaluation comes out noisy. And uh, this is very handy and also in machine learning this is now more and more used. Um, in machine learning there is a popular term now, Bayesian optimization. And uh, Bayesian optimization is the application of Gaussian processes uh, to solve noisy functions and to, to, to optimize noisy functions. Um, so a picture says more than a thousand words. Let's have a look at the, 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 at the right-hand side here. Now, um, let me draw you a picture of what we initially start with. Initially, we have a, um, a probability distribution for a function. So here we have, uh, we have some mean. So the, 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 the line in the middle, this is the mean. And then uh, around that, we have like a tube of, let's say, the 95% confidence interval. So this here is this here is f of x, and this here is x. Yeah. And um, now, if this was if this were a noisy uh, function, then we would assume that uh, this is Gaussian distributed. So then, if I select, for example, this point here, and I I, I, am, I make a cut. I cut like this, then what I would find is that um, the function um, f of x at this point is like a Gaussian distribution. Uh, so here this is x0 and let's see and then this is also the x0 um, and there we would find a Gaussian distribution at this point. Okay and if it would just be uh, a noisy function that that would already be enough. So we have a mean for for the function at every point, and also we have a variance for for the function at every point. But now we let this express not only how noisy the function is, but we express also our own um, unsecurity or our own limited information also by a uh, probability distribution. So now this not only expresses how little we know, it also expresses uh, how noisy it is, it also expresses how little we know. And now by evaluating the function, we can uh, reduce the uncertainty that we have. Yeah. Now let's say we evaluate this function at this location here, and this is now this location here, we get a certain result. And then at this point, our uncertainty is reduced. And now here, um, now here, this confidence interval at this point would 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 shrink down. <coughs> okay, and we can do the same at a couple of different locations. So we evaluate here, and we evaluate here, and we evaluate here, and now you see how in the original image, so which is now the the the, the middle. Um, how the uncertainty it is reduced at the places where we have evaluated the function. Uh, and um, in the background, these Gaussian processes, they also use uh, a kernel function similar to what we saw for the SVM. And uh, the kernel function, it states um, how much I can trust the, the, the individual evaluations and how much each evaluation should impact its neighbors. Yeah? So, um, if this should look like this, if I evaluate, um, or if it should like should look like this, if if I evaluate, um, okay. And now the trick of um, Bayesian optimization 
is uh, to iteratively evaluate the function and then have a look at the remaining uncertainty to select the best point that I want to evaluate next. Yeah. And here the point with the star, the point with the star is where I want to evaluate next. And this is because um, here I still have uncertainty, so this could still contain a better solution, but also the mean that I expect at this point is, is better than um, uh, or the, the combination of the mean plus the remaining uncertainty is that I prefer to, to do the evaluation there. Uh, so this is the expected utility of, of, of uh, evaluating at, at a certain location. And I always here take the point of maximum utility. And then it is actually kind of similar to what we saw earlier with the, the Lipschitz here in optimization. Um, for this expected utility, I can also combine it with cost. So if I know that a cost is more expensive for the evaluation at some location than at another, I can also integrate that back here in this expected utility. And uh, one area where this is used a lot is for hyperparameter optimization in machine learning. So imagine that you have you, you train a neural network and you train it with a certain set of, of hyperparameters. Yeah? So how you parameterize dropout or how you parameterize the learning rate, or also do you what what do you use um, uh, for stochastic gradient descent? Do you use um, a specialized technique like Adam or, or, or RMS prop or something else. So there are a lot of choices that you make on top of the actual uh, neural network architecture. So you have to select hyperparameters. And the question is, how do you get to the best hyperparameters? And you can do that by using Bayesian optimization, where you, you, you try out the, the training for the neural network for a couple of iterations. And then you see how fast the, the loss is dropping. And then you use that as an information uh, for your Gaussian process to, to, to do a search in um, the, the space of hyperparameters. Uh, but of course, the training of a neural network is, is randomized. And therefore, there is some noise to that process. And therefore, you need to use a stochastic optimization technique to optimize the, the hyperparameters of your, of your learning method. What we just saw, this was stochastic optimization in a more or less continuous setting, but there is also stochastic optimization in uh, discrete or combinatorial settings. And uh, what we're looking at here is the so-called Monte Carlo tree search algorithm. And uh, this became famous because it is at the very core of the AlphaGo system that was used just a few years ago to beat the world champion in, in the Go game. And so uh, Monte Carlo tree search, it came up in uh, 2006 and in the last years the technique was really mastered and also successfully combined with, with neural networks and um, um, in, in, in game settings that were considered really difficult before, Monte Carlo tree search is now, is now a state of the art technique. So. Um, what do we see here? Uh, just to give you some nomenclature, we have a tree and the tree represents a game situation. So this could be with two players playing against each other, but it could also be a single player playing against a stochastic uh, environment. Uh, and uh, the game situation is important because we can always reset. We can reset to, to the start and then play out for the same situation once more and draw essentially from the same probability distribution or maybe even have a, a deterministic game environment. But we can reset the game. Um, there are many tree search algorithms um, and um, the, the main advantage of Monte Carlo tree search is, um, or one of the main advantages, is that it only needs to have a forward simulation. So we don't need to do expensive backtracking steps in, in the tree search. We always reset to the very start and go from there. Right? So when we have arrived at some particular situation in our game tree, when we are here, we never jump back just to the previous one, which also would be 
difficult to 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 do in a, in a um, in a stochastic environment. So this would probably mess up a lot of uh, a lot of things. Um, um, and we always restart from, from, from the very top, from the root of our game tree. So now we have our nodes and we call them i. And um, every, um, every node, it returns a reward uh, ri. But for this reward, we not only count the immediate reward that we get at this location, but we also count all the reward that is seen afterwards. So for example, if I'm in this, if I select this tree, and then the then the reward uh, contains also the reward from 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 the second sub from two subsequent uh, nodes. Okay, and I can now produce a, a statistics. I can now um, um, I can now collect um, um, uh, empirically how how much the average reward was behind every node, and I collect that in R i uh, bar. Uh, so this guy here, this is the empirical mean reward. Okay. And furthermore, um, while I am playing or while I am searching in the tree, I am uh, making a statistics by counting for every node how often did I try it out. Uh, and this is this n nine here. Now. How did people find the, the idea of Monte Carlo tree search? There is one big motivation going back in the past, uh, the so-called John of Höfting inequality, uh, a famous and also rather old already inequality from um, um, uh, um, well, probability theory. And uh, this inequality it tells us that if I have a random variable uh, x, and I make uh, independent drawings from this random variable and the random variable has a mean mu, then there is an inequality that the distance between the, the, the mean um, drawing, the mean of the drawings minus the mean, so this, is, this would be like x bar, so the empirical mean minus mu, the actual mean, the, the distance between the two on the positive side larger than epsilon, the probability for that happening is smaller than, than here this uh, exponential term. Um, we're not asking you about this in the exam. The entire lecture of today is excluded from the exam. Um, and uh, this is only to tell you why Monte Carlo tree search was, was tried out initially. Um, this chain of Höfting inequality it is true for any probability distribution. So if we know there is a probability distribution with mean mu, then we know the channel of Hefting bound to, uh, to exist and to be true. Um, and it works for every probability distribution. And now the core idea is that we are in a stochastic setting and um, behind every uh, branch that we can take, here, behind every branch i that we can take in the tree, what comes behind this branch, it has a mean uh, reward ri, and the question is how can we bound this mean reward ri? Yeah? And the chain of Höfting inequality it gives us a way to bound for for some error uh, epsilon the uh, the um, the uh, the, the, the reward coming from that branch, and, and this is now used in Monte Carlo tree search. What Monte Carlo tree search does, it, it has to balance exploration and exploitation. So the exploration means I go into areas in the game tree where I haven't ever been before, or where I have seldomly been before, where I can still discover new things. And the exploitation part, it means I go into areas of the search tree that have worked good in the past and where I want to refine my strategy. So exploration means go off, go somewhere new. Exploitation means refine my strategy or even reap the reward by over and over playing the, um, the best 
um, solution that is known so far. And you have to balance between the two. And um, in, the, the, in the lineage of these methods, this comes out of research into so-called bandits, uh, and um, which, which is uh, very close to game theory. But um, you can think about this like a, a one-armed bandit. If you go into a casino in Las Vegas, and you have these slot machines, the one-armed bandits, and you have like a hundred slot machines, and you want to find out which slot machine is the best, and then you want to play that on end. The question is, how long do you look for the best slot machine, and um, uh, when do you stick to the best one you have found, and when do you maybe change and say, well, maybe this isn't the best one after all. <coughs> and um, on top of that, you can uh, do this also with a limited budget. So if you have $100 initially in coins, or if you have $1,000 initially in coins, how would that change your approach of finding the best slot machine versus playing then the best slot machine? And this is the research into, into so-called bandit settings. And now Monte Carlo research, it combines like the motivation from the Jan Höfting inequality uh, with, uh, with, uh, with tree search. Okay. Now we start with some initial random baseline policy. So there is a baseline policy and in the case of, um, uh, um, for example, the Go game, um, there were already uh, existing uh, algorithms before to play Go and uh, you could initially just pick one of them and say, well, this is my baseline policy. And now you want to refine the baseline policy. And uh, what you do is um, you, you build up the game tree and the game tree essentially is a statistics that tells you uh, if I pick this branch, what is my expected reward going into that branch? Um, and now in order to balance the exploration and the exploitation, uh, we are adding a bias to um, each of the branches. And the bias goes as follows. We are estimating the value of the branch by Ri, which is the empirical reward that we have seen so far, the empirical mean reward. And now we add the bias and the bias, it depends on how often I have visited the branch compared to the parent where I'm sitting at right now. So I'm sitting here and this is the parent and I am con I'm considering this guy and I'm considering this guy. And um, uh, now we have this, this uh, bias, which is motivated by the channel hefting inequality. And, uh, and that tells me that I should go, that I have a less of a positive bias uh, for branches that were visited often. Uh, so if I've been oftentimes in a certain branch, if this NI here is big, then I don't give it an exploration bias. Uh, however, when I've been in the parent quite often, comparatively, then the exploration bias now increases. Okay. And there is um, a constant C and I can use that to switch between, um, or I can balance how, how exploration happy I, I am in, in my approach. Okay. And now what happens is for Monte Carlo research, we iteratively play the game. And when we are in a area of the game tree that we know, then we will always choose the action that has the best um, estimated value, so um, um, Ri plus the exploration bias, and I will always pick the one that works best. When I am at the edge, or where I have uh, actions that I have never played before in the game tree, then I will um, randomly, or with my baseline policy, uh, pick one of those that I haven't played so far and then do a rollout and the rollout means with the baseline policy play until the end of the game. And uh, afterwards um, I will add exactly one new node to the game. So here I have played I have played with my rollout. Um, I've played the rollout with the baseline policy and now I'm adding exactly one new um, node uh, for every iteration of the game 
and uh, do a backtracking where I'm updating all of the nodes that have been encountered during this particular play. Okay, and so over and over I, I repeat this and uh, the algorithm it will balance out exploration and exploitation and will quickly converge to a couple of areas in the tree that look promising. But the more I play, it will also include some other areas of the tree that is now starting to explore as well. Yeah? So it balances the refinement of the good strategies and the exploration of totally new game strategies. And this is at the very heart of, of AlphaGo. And this now works also for the Go game where I can have hundreds of actions that are possible in parallel. And what AlphaGo did on top is uh, it, uh, it applied a pruning. So uh, in, instead of having 200 possible plays, there were then maybe only tens uh, or a couple of dozen um, actions uh, available for every branch of the game tree. And this was helping a lot. And the second was um, the baseline policy now was also improved and, and based on, on, on the neural network. Yeah. And that way, the combination of Monte Carlo tree search with neural networks uh, uh, helped in, in beating the, the world champion in, in, in the Go game. 